Sister Cindy, is she in? I don't see her name now. She was early, I'm not sure what happened. Maybe she has a bad connection. So maybe we need to go on to the next speaker. All right. So time. without further ado, we'll wait on Professor Bello. I will call on Sister Fanta to introduce Professor Gerald Horn, our next speaker. Mike. Mr. Fanta. Good yes, afternoon, you Mike. Yes. Professor Gerald Horn was born in St. Louis, Missouri. After his undergraduate education at Princeton University, he received his PhD from Columbia University and a JD from the University of California at Berkeley. Professor Horn holds the John J. and Rebecca Moores Chair of History and African American Studies at the University of Houston. He has written some 30 odd books and is a frequent contributor to Political Affairs Magazine. Professor Horn has published on W.D. Du Bois and has written books on neglected but by no means marginal or minor episodes of world history. He writes about topics he perceived as misrepresented struggles for justice, in particular communist struggles and struggles against imperialism, communism, fascism, racism, and white supremacy. Individuals who lives, who lives his work has highlighted in their historical context have included the blacklisted Hollywood screenwriter, John Howard Lawson, Ferdinand Smith, who's a Jamaican-born communist sailor, labor leader, and co-founder of the National Mar Maritime Union. An African-American, and Lawrence uh, Dennis, he's also written about him, who's an African-American fascist and racist who has passed for white. And the being, the being Professor Horn has written on frequently examined periods and aspects of the history of white supremacy and imperialism, such as the post-Civil War involvement of the U.S. ruling class, newly disposed of human chattel with slavery in Brazil, which was not legally abolished, by the way, until 1888, or the attempts by the Japanese imperialist in the mid 20th century to appear as the leader of a global war against white supremacy, thus allies and instruments of liberation for people of color oppressed by imperialism has quoted. Late Professor Manning Marable said this, Gerald Horn is one of the most gifted and insightful historians on racial matters of his generation. So it's a pleasure to have him here with us this evening. Welcome. Welcome Professor Horn, the floor is open to you. Please unmute your mic, sir. Unmute your mic. How's that? Yeah. First of all, thank you uh, for inviting me uh, to this event. I had expected other speakers to precede me to lay the general groundwork for understanding of our topic. However, that has not taken place. So let me first of all say that the Haitian Revolution 1791 to 1804 was one of the most significant world historic events of human history. It represented a victory of the enslaved, not only over the enslavers, but it also helped to change the global correlation of forces to the benefit not only of people of African descent, but I would also argue for the benefit of any who sold their labor for a living. In other words, the Haitian Revolution ignited a general crisis of the entire slave system that could only be resolved with the collapse of that very system. Uh, it's no accident that after the triumph of the Haitian Revolution, uh, not least in North America, you began to see advances for people of working class origin generally, 
And I would also add that the Haitian Revolution, 1791 to 1804, in my humble estimation, was a response to the so-called American Revolution, and I underscore so-called, of 1776, uh, which represented a victory for slave owners. Uh, I start my book on the Haitian Revolution by discussing the frenzied and hysterical reaction of one George Washington in 1791 after hearing about the stirrings of the enslaved on the island that was called uh, Hispaniola. Uh, it was understandable why George Washington would be nervous and anxious about these events in the Caribbean because it was not long before the man we now know as Gabriel tried to lead a revolt of the enslaved in Virginia circa 1800 with a direct inspiration from the events due south in the Caribbean in the nation we came to know as Haiti. Uh, indeed, uh, it's fair to suggest that many people of African descent in the hemisphere, not least in the neighboring Caribbean islands, particularly Jamaica, uh, took inspiration uh, from the Haitian Revolution and helped to hasten the day when that inhumane system of slavery would finally reach its end. I also point out in my book on the Haitian Revolution that the revolt led by Nat Turner in Virginia in 1831, uh, which also had dramatic import and impact, likely was influenced, if not inspired, by the Haitian Revolution. But in the immediate sense, the triumph of the Haitian Revolution in 1804 led London to realize that the better part of wisdom would be to try to cease bringing further grave diggers known as enslaved Africans across the Atlantic to engage in the burying of the slave system. Because basically by bringing more Africans to the hemisphere, uh, you were bringing more Africans likely to revolt against the hate, hated system of slavery. And so you see in 1807 that London moves to halt its own role in the African slave trade, followed by what was coming to be the heavyweight champion of slavery and the slave trade, speaking of the United States of America, which the following year in 1808 tries to move away from the slave trade as well. Now, of course, we all know that with regard to the United States, despite legally moving away from participation in the African slave trade, they continue, that is to say US nationals, their ongoing participation uh, in this odious commerce. We know that US slave owners and slave traders had ousted the Spanish as early as the 1790s from captaining and championing the existence of the trade in enslaved Africans to Spanish Cuba. We know that by the 1840s, U.S. slave traders were preeminent in terms of bringing enslaved Africans, not least from Angola and Mozambique, to the largest slave market of all, speaking of Brazil. But in any case, when London decided to move away from the slave trade in 1807, not least because of repetitive revolt, revolts that were erupting in Jamaica, Barbados, uh, Antigua, uh, etc. It gives impetus for London to move away from slavery itself by the 1830s. I should also say that a, an important aspect of the triumph of the Haitian Revolution was that it provided a kind of rear base for Africans in the hemisphere. Uh, we know, for example, that if you look at the history of colonialism, it was very important for those who were struggling against South African apartheid pre-1994 to have a rear base in Mozambique, which had triumphed over 
Portuguese colonialism circa 1975, or in Angola with the triumph over Portuguese colonialism circa 1975. Likewise, the triumph of the Haitian Revolution began to attract uh, many U.S. Negroes uh, to the Caribbean, to uh, revolutionary Haiti, uh, not to mention uh, Africans from surrounding islands. This was a very important aspect of the uh, importance of the Haitian Revolution. And likewise, the triumph of the Haitian Revolution provided diplomatic support for the struggle against slavery generally in this hemisphere. It's also important to note that uh, the Haitian Revolution not only provided inspiration for Gabriel's revolt in Virginia in 1800, but also for the revolt led by Denmark Vesey in South Carolina about 200 years ago. Uh, we recognize that it was not so long ago that a young white supremacist invaded a church in Charleston, South Carolina and massacred uh, nine black parishioners, or a number of black parishioners, I should say, in the same church, at least name-wise, in which Denmark Vesey had plotted his revolt in that very same Charleston, South Carolina. I should also say that the Haitian Revolution triumphed at a time when it did not have many friends and allies in the international community. And that led inevitably, as I point out in my book, to one of the most successful covert actions of Washington in a ignominious history of covert actions, speaking of the separation of the Dominican Republic from Haiti in the 1840s, which set off a chain reaction of conflict between Haiti and the Dominican Republic for decades to come uh, a, a conflict which has not ceased altogether, but a conflict which repetitively and repeatedly uh, helped to weaken the uh, Haitian Revolution. I should mention as well that with the advent of the U.S. Civil War, uh, 1861 to 1865, uh, Washington may have come to rue the day that it sought to weaken the Haitian Revolution because what it found was that in Spanish Cuba, you had a slave owning enterprise that at best was ambivalent about the triumph of the Lincoln government over the slave owning Confederacy. And as you all know, the British in Jamaica, Barbados, et cetera, also were somewhat ambivalent about the uh, triumph of the Lincoln government. Uh, it's fair to say, in fact, that London took the rather cynical or sarcastic viewpoint that they liked the United States so much and they liked Republican rule so much that they wanted to see two Republican governments in Washington, DC. Uh, one, a Confederate government and another, a Lincoln government. In any case, Haiti turned out to be the most reliable anti-slavery ally of the Lincoln government and provided important strategic and diplomatic support to the Lincoln government in its attempt to weaken and ultimately defeat the so-called Confederate States of America, which revolted against the United States in order to perpetuate slavery forevermore. Uh, finally, uh, I, I should mention, uh, where do we go from here, at least in terms of scholarship concerning the Haitian Revolution, because we all know that politically, we all know what time it is. We all know that uh, Haiti needs our solidarity uh, more than ever. But scholarship, I think, needs to focus on the fact that if you look at the great Toussaint, uh, the epitome, the embodiment of the Haitian Revolution, a uh, research shows that there are documents in 90 different archives reflecting the writings of Toussaint Louverture. Uh, it would be very worthwhile to not only collect all of those documents, but to digitize those documents and place them online. And likewise, if Toussaint Louverture's writings can be found in 1990 different archives, uh, we can only imagine 
how many archives there are worldwide in which you can find documents concerning the Haitian Revolution. What I mean is we need to start a project that looks at Haiti's role in one of the most epical and significant events in human history, that is to say the abolishing of chattel slavery during the time period of 1804 with the triumph of the Haitian Revolution to 1888 when Brazilian slavery was finally defeated. I dare say that you'll be able to find these documents not only in the usual places, of course, Haiti itself, throughout Latin America, London, Paris, Russia, but I would also say uh, in Japan and Southern Africa as well. Uh, this is a project uh, well worth pursuing. It will help to generate a deeper understanding of the debt of gratitude all people owe particularly working people, people such as ourselves, the debt of gratitude we all owe to those who struggled mightily over 200 years ago to defeat that inhumane monster known as slavery. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, um, Professor Horn. Um, what we will do, we'll have the next speaker and then we will open the floor. We'll allow Professor Bello, if she's on, to come up come back and then we'll have the other speaker and we'll take questions. So I'll call on Brother Bakari to introduce the next speaker. Unmute your mic, Brother Bakari. Good evening to all in the session. The pleasure is mine to introduce Dr. Pascal Lafans, who is a Bachelor of Arts in Africana Studies from Hamilton College, a PhD in Global Studies from the University of Irving, and his interests in research and teaching are in the areas of South-South migration, West African history, Caribbean Amer African American history, and he has been able to, through his work, uh, gain a number of scholarships, the Posse Scholarship in 2015, the George A. What Trans Literary Prize for Creative Writing in 2016, the Rose B. Tiger Prize in 2017, and the Gemara Scholarship in 2017. It is my pleasure to now introduce Dr. Pascal Daffins to the session. Hello, uh, thank you for having me. Um, I just want to make a clarification. I'm not a doctor yet. Um, I'm a first year PhD student. Um, so um, I, this is just research that I'm going to be presenting pres potentially that I hope to do uh, concerning my community um, in Haiti. Um, so it's going to be concerning the uh, Haitian diaspora in Tijuana, Mexico, right? Um, so currently I'm a graduate student at um, UC Irvine in California. And um, I just want to talk a little bit more about um, the diaspora, um, migration um, out of Haiti, and um, making a connection between the Haitian Revolution and migration across um, the, the global south, or at least um, um, anything that's uh, not a part of the Western world, the traditional Western world, right? All right, so I'm just gonna do a quick PowerPoint with you guys, and we can get started. So, <clears throat> Moving can be a very difficult and uncomfortable thing. I know this particularly well because my parents moved from Haiti to the United States in the 1980s to escape the oppressive Duvalier regime. Right? They relocated um, from Haiti to New York City and eventually settled down in Miami. But I'm not going to talk about that today. Today I want to talk about um, Haitian migrants in Tijuana, Mexico. You're probably wondering to yourself, how did Haitian migrants end up in Tijuana, Mexico of all places, right? Well, it's a really interesting story. Following the 2010 earthquake, um, many Haitians were displaced and received humanitarian visas from different parts of Latin America. One of those places was Brazil. Brazil in, the, in 2014 and 2016 was hosting the FIFA World Cup and the Summer Olympics, respectively. So they were looking for a lot of cheap laborers to come and work um, for construction and different uh, service industry jobs. 
and Haitian migrants provided that source of labor. It's not surprising that Haitian migrants have become this sort of workforce when we consider their position globally in the world, right? One of the first nations to abolish slavery eventually becomes um, marginalized and in much parts of Latin America, following a lot of economic downturn because of this without ability to um, play a factor in the international trade regime it becomes very difficult for Haiti to be, emerge as a um, international um, player in the global trade world. So um, it's not surprising that many Haitians in the 21st and 20th century become um, migrants going to the global north, the first world, second world countries, right, as cheap laborers. The journey to Tijuana began as a 7,003 month journey across Brazil to Central America and around the time of 2016 during the Trump administration. Uh, this is from a, a Haitian researcher's name, Joel, uh, jo Joel Julian. Um, she was in Tijuana, Mexico for some time. So basically we saw a migration from Brazil after the FIFA World Cup and the uh, and the Summer Olympics through parts of Colombia, Ecuador, Panama, Costa Rica, Nicaragua, all the way to Tijuana, Mexico, right? So that's about in the Northern part of Mexico, right? I'll just put a small X right there for you guys to understand, right? And basically my research, I want to focus on black, how black Haitians operate as both the hyper-visible and invisible migrant within the Central American caravans. So this previous administration in the United States has really focused a lot on the, um, the threat of the Central American caravans, of the criminals who come from the Central American states of Nicaragua, Guatemala, and Honduras. Um, so my research, hopefully in the next four or five years, if I get a chance to do this research, I want to focus on the small group of Haitians who found their way to um, Tijuana, Mexico. I just wanna show you a small video about um, the experience of Haitians in Tijuana, Mexico. Thousands of Haitians working in Latin America headed for the border last year, crossing into San Diego through Tijuana. But in September, US officials announced a change in policy. Haitians would no longer be granted humanitarian parole. Facing deportation to Haiti if they crossed, many Haitians opted to remain in Mexico. Nixon Pierre arrived in Tijuana last December, four months after leaving Caracas, Venezuela, where he had been studying medicine. The choices have not been easy ones. Primeramente, no tenemos a nadie en, en, en Tijuana, no, no tenemos familia. Yo y mi primo teníamos nuestra familia que estaba esperando a, a nosotros eh, por allá. Yo personalmente, yo gasto más de 5 mil dólares hasta llegar aquí. Mi primo también sale de Brasil, gasta más, más de 7 mil dólares. Filocles Julda now has a job at a maquiladora and a place to stay. Though struggling and away from family, he said he is better off than when he first came to the city. Yo me siento un poco mejor porque antes, pero yo estaba en albergue. Cuando yo estaba en albergue, yo veo que las cosas es difícil para mí porque es difícil es cuando la mayoría de las personas vive juntos. Es no es una cosa buena, pero como la persona estaba en las dificultades, pero de cualquier manera. Se vive así, pero no es una vida perfecta vivir en albergue. Estamos en la Iglesia Embajadores de Jesús y lo que se le conoce la Villa Haitiana. La Villa Haitiana son unas pequeñas casas que nosotros estamos construyendo para nuestros hermanos haitianos que se quedaron atrapados en esta ciudad de Tijuana. The pastor has been a strong supporter of Haitians. Even as other shelters have shut down, he has continued to house them at his church and is building small houses for them. The residents say that life is hard in Tijuana, but it beats the alternative. Nadie quiere regresar a Haití eh, por 
porque la verdad las condiciones de Haití son muy difíciles. Ahora, ¿quiénes están deprimidos? Bueno, los esposos que se quedaron aquí y sus esposas están en los Estados Unidos y saben que es muy difícil que ellos puedan llegar a los Estados Unidos. Los que están solteros, bueno, son más optimistas porque ellos ya tienen una visa humanitaria y pueden hacer su vida aquí. Nixon Pierre said he never planned to live in Tijuana, but while he misses family members in Haiti and Venezuela, he is adjusting to his new life. Bueno, eh, la vida no, eh, nunca diga nunca, porque nunca se sabe. Entonces, como, como me gusta decirlo, y, y me considero como ciudadano del mundo, pero vivo en cualquier país del mundo. Entonces, como Tijuana me da la oportunidad de, de vivir aquí. Sí. All right, so um, just to continue, I want to expand on the, the, the social relations in Tijuana, Mexico, right? And basically talk about um, the Central American, American caravans, right? Um, that have bas basically been occurring um, where there's large um, migration of Central Americans from Guatemala, Nicaragua, and um, Honduras to, Tijuana, um, to the northern parts of Mexico um, to, to the United States. And there's been a lot of confrontations between the, um, um, the residents of Tijuana, right? And the uh, Central Americans who um, are quote unquote invading Tijuana, Mexico, right? Um, this is a very interesting, um, interesting phenomenon of these protests against uh, Central Americans um, um, of how they are racialized and how they are uh, described by the residents in Tijuana, Mexico, right? You can see a photo of a man um, carrying a flag that says no a la invasión, which basically translates to no to the invasion, right? Um, I think this is something that maybe a lot of people, black people in the global south can um, relate to, um, especially considering the recent um, EU crisis or the uh, European migration crisis that's been going on since 2008, uh, the migration crisis that has been going on in South Africa, right? Um, the migration of Jamaican laborers um, from Jamaica to Cuba or different parts of Canada um, in Cuba in direct relation of, um, um, of uh, sugarcane uh, production in Cuba, right? So this is a very, uh, this is, this is, this migration parallels a lot of historical um, migrations that we've seen in the past. Um, what is interesting is that Haitians are largely invisible in this dialogue, right? Um, they're not really talked about much. Um, the few people who know about them um, are the ones who are actually localized or who actually are on the West Coast, but it's not a really much of a global phenomenon. Um, in, in a research statement um, by Joelle J Julien, she says that she um, went to a local tourist um, destination and one of the hostess in, in, in a bar told her uh, a, a small description of Haitians uh, that, that he knew of. And he said that they are such a hardworking people. They are speaking the language too. I hear you can find their restaurants in El Centro, meaning the center of the city, and that their food is great but the host also warns about a lot of bad people in El Centro, the addicts and the criminals. And these people that they're referring to are the Central Americans, right? Um, the uh, migrants who are also a part of the caravans who take um, the forefront in, in who, are, who are the most depicted in these uh, Central American caravans. So I'm hoping to do some research on um, solidarity and ethnicity struggle within these caravans, right? Um, so I want to ask the question of what role does presumed race slash nationality play in strengthening or weakening solidarity and community struggle in um, different parts of uh, La Via Haitiana um, or the um, Little Haiti that has been established in Tijuana, Mexico? And are there any examples of protests or everyday um, life that lead to solidarity between Haitian migrants and other Central American migrants, right? So that's what I really want to focus on in my studies for the next five, six years. Um, I haven't gotten a chance to go to Tijuana, Mexico yet because of the recent pandemic. Um, 
But these are my theoretical frameworks. I'm hoping to focus on racialization, how are Haitians and Central Americans perceived, the autonomy of migration. So really focusing on um, giving agency to migrants, right? Uh, global capitalism and migration. And I'm hoping to do semi-structured interviews of observation and participation observation and an ethnographic model, right? So just to wrap it up, just to really make you guys contextualize the, um, the living experiences of um, Haitians and other African migrants in, in Tijuana, Mexico, I'm gonna talk about the maquidora or the um, factories that basically allow the manufacturing of goods at a lower tariff. And these have been established in um, parts of Mexico since the 1960s, right? And um, there's this small quotation that says, um, everything is at following, following um, the start of the pandemic um, last year. Um, this is from Walter. He says, everything is at risk. He's 20 years, 28 years old and he's a migrant from Haiti. He has to be identified only by his first name because he did not want to risk future employment. He said he had to scrape together money selling masks on the side of the road, but was looking for a steadier paycheck. The informal work exposed him to him more to the public and thus COVID-19, he said. So these um, so what's interesting is that in Tijuana, Mexico, a lot of these Central Americans, these Haitian and black migrants from different parts of Africa are working in these maquidoras or in these um, factory settings, right? And they're exposing, they're the most exposed to COVID-19 in Tijuana, Mexico because of their working conditions, right? So there's maybe possible um, chances for labor unions, who knows, right? Um, lastly, I just wanted to point out that this is really important to think of um, how the, while the coronavirus virus has not directly stigmatized the Haitian community in Tijuana, Mexico, we must be aware of the common rhetoric used by the global north. So we're talking about France, Italy, um, the United States, um, these developed Western countries, England, right? Um, borders have protected the healthy, healthy global north, the Western world, and the, and the disease-ridden global south. Um, this past year has proved that a lot of xenophobia has um, really come out, especially considering the fact uh, that this virus, the epicenter of this virus, or the, 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 the start of the virus was really in China, right? And a lot of racist rhetoric um, came out. So it's interesting to um, really think about um, the, the position of Haiti when we talk about um, um, pandemics or at least um, the, the spread of infectious diseases, right? Um, since the early 1970s and 1980s, Haiti has been stigmatized or Haitians have been stigmatized with uh, the uh, spread of the HIV virus, right? And um, that has been met with large resistance. Um, and I think that um, this current pandemic um, really is going to um, shape uh, the future decades of, of, our, of, our, of our global community, all right? These are my works cited, and um, I just wanted to thank Mr. Westmoss for inviting me here today, and I'm all done. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Pascal. Um, is Professor Bello in? Yes, I'm yes. in. Okay. okay. Take, welcome, Professor Bello. Thank Greetings you. Greetings on behalf of the com committee and the participants and me, the floor is open to you. I'm sorry, the sound is really very low. I am not certain what you said. You are, we have opened the floor for you to participate and speak. Very good, thank you very much. Greetings to all. In the, in the name of all those who came before me, all the forces of the universe, all that created, empowered the, our people in IET to become free. I greet you and as I transfer to you that which brought IET from slave to empire. So the significance of it, uh, in order to be able to identify the significance of what Aitians realized uh, between 1492 and 1803, I'm not mistaken, I say between 1492 and 1803. 
because we like to look at all the way they have the template given to us by Euro-Christian scholars. Talk of the, from 1791 to 1803. Now that's only one part of the struggle. The fight began in 1492 as the Euro-Christians invaded the island, the Arawak, the Taino, the Siboney, all of them fought to remain free. But they put silence on that. And we as scholars and children of these people and descendants of these people, we must put the light on their struggle as well. Then as they brought our people from Africa to Haiti, a transfer was made from the Arawak to the Africans, which taught us, taught the Africans, many of the ways of getting about and surviving on the island. That information is vital in building the revolutionaries. But again, that's silence because Euro-Christians didn't choose to speak about that, then we don't. We must correct that. Now, if I take the time that everybody talks about 1791 to 1803, we ignore the contribution of women, the contribution of children, the contribution of elders, the contribution of centenarians. When we talk of somebody like Toussaint Louverture, he was raised by his godfather, who was 116 years old on the day they arrested Toussaint. And he was the only person that the French were not able to keep him away from Toussaint. They did not want anyone to come as they take Toussaint away. But Pierre Simon Baptiste walked from Henry to Gonaïve following Toussaint as they took him. He was tied behind a horse. Sometimes he fell, many times. And the, the godfather would be there and saying, get up, my son, get up. In our family, we don't die laying down, get up. So all the way to the end, the only person who was with Toussaint was his godfather, 116 years old. Silence in our books. So what is the significance of what Aishin realized on this island? Number one, we have to recognize the first people's struggle and their contribution and what they passed on to the newcomers, the Africans. Number one. Number two, when we talk of the role of women, in IT, the ruling, the, 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 the head of the government was a crown. Crown was made of five people. It is a law by the Arawak Sentinos. You cannot have five men. You cannot have five women at the head of the country. It must be one, four, two, three, three, four, whichever way, but there must be both energies. The feminine and the masculine must be at the head of the country. So feminism is not teaching us anything. Then as we created the maroon societies, those who ran away from slavery and established their own way of lives in the woods, it was the same rule. The women and the men were equal. You, it was competence, not equal, excuse me. Competence is what determined what your role would be. If you're best qualified to fight, we don't care if you are female or male, but you must, uh, uh, you will fight. If you're best in cooking, whether you're male or female, that's what you will do. So we need to look at uh, what our ancestors have left for us and not be always when somebody comes up with something we go for that so significance role of women role of children in the fight role of elders in the fight is important now we talk of bookman but no one mentioned cecil fatima who took four years to organize the congress where we decided that we would fight and not accept the situation as it is. We would go into a fight. So our children, the question was this, the question was put this way. What must we do 
in order for our children and our grandchildren not to suffer the misery that we are suffering now. So we look carefully at that question. That question is not saying, how do I get out of the suffering? The question is, how do I behave so my children and my grandchildren will not know the suffering that I'm suffering today? So that kind of forward looking uh, uh, um, thinking is vital and we must put, we scholars must adopt this way of thinking, not looking for a job or a book or success, but doing a work from the heart, from the soul, so our children and our grandchildren will truly inherit a life better than the one we have today. The time is short, we will shorten our discourse, but it is vital that we understand that if we don't pick up what our own ancestors have done, and like uh, Professor uh, Horn mentioned, uh, how it's important, it would be great for us to go and collect the information that is around the world, and it's true. I have experienced it in my research. When I went, for example, in Switzerland, and I went all over looking for information on IET, couldn't find anything. They didn't have anything until I discovered there's such thing as the rare books room. And when I entered the rare books room, it was a totally different world. I could find, I found things about IT that I never dreamt of. So we have to learn the tactics of how these people arrange the information. The information is just as colonized as we are. Hmm. So we must uncolonize, decolonize ourselves. So we will be in a better position to find the information that we need in order to grow and advance. So, the presence of women, the presence of children, the presence of elders, the presence, presence of centenarians, understanding what they left for us and take that in a scholarly manner and transmit so that it becomes our way of growing, not constantly quoting others, quoting slavers, quoting colonizers, we must get out of that and get into the, the information. And let me show you very quickly. The constitution, the imperial constitution of 1805, which is the first constitution of IT. In it, the emperor, there's an article that says that we reject the unjust idea that the children of the emperor should become the next emperors. Too many children, too many people have fought, have bled in order to create the nation. So the next emperor must be voted in. And he must, the first element of qualification is his contribution to freedom. Now this kind of uh, uh, basis for choosing a leader is something that is to me, extremely important. But we found this nowhere in none of the other constitutions of IET. Why? Did the Aitians revoke them? Or were they given to Aitians? Is the imperial constitution of 1805 the only true crew from the Aitian soul? This is also the only constitution that says, in order to merit the, the quality of being a citizen of IT, you must be a good son, a good father, a good spouse, and most of all, a great soldier. Ha, how come we have thought of these things in 1805 and today, so many of our children don't have a father's name on their birth certificates. You see the dysfunctioning between our words and other people's words running our lives. So 
the significance. How did Haiti go from slave to emperor? Because that's what happened. We go, we fought, the Spanish fought and won over Spanish army, fought and won over the British. And by the way, Jamaicans, let me tell you that the British came here with about 5,000 Jamaicans in 1801. And as they were, they, they, they were losing, so a lot of people were dying, of course, they put the black people in front. So they get killed more easily. Now, in the end, as they back off and go onto their boats, there was 1,500 Jamaicans. We're talking about black people, of course. They put them on separate boats. And you know what the wonderful British army did? They set fire to the boats. They cooked them Jamaicans because they did not want our Jamaican brothers to go back and tell the others what whipping the British army took at the hands of black people in, in Haiti. Of course, it wasn't Haiti at the time, it was still Saint-Domingue, but it was us. Haiti was in the making even then, 1801. So uh, we must also say that uh, after Haiti became independent, over something like 300 Jamaicans, because Haiti had a law, any black person running away from slavery stepping foot on the island is free. So they took a boat, about 300 of them, Jamaicans came to Haiti, became citizens. But do you understand what that means when Haiti had this law? These people are ready to slaughter entire nations for one slave. So when you accept to keep these, the, 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 the brothers and sisters here, that means you also accept to face up to British, French, German, and everybody else's guns to take to, to you know to, to get these people back. IT refused. IT kept the Jamaicans, the Jamaicans became Haitians, and they lived here. So we need to know really what the Haitian artistry is. And yes, yeah, not because I have an accent, I do, but I chose to say artistry not his story, because our people, children, men, women, girls, elders, centenarians, everybody participated in the revolution. A woman like Marie-Jeanne with a troop of 1,000 women, no men in her troops, was fighting. A, a woman like uh, uh, Agbara Yatoya from Dahomey, who raised Dessaline and told him all his life, you must bring freedom here. He was raised that way by a woman. Uh, when he became engaged with Marie-Claire Rose Félicité Bonheur, she taught him how to read and write French, the French language. He knew how to read other language, but he did not know French, how to read and write French. So he, she taught him. Uh, Toussaint Louverture had Grande Pélagie, she was 105 years old when Toussaint was arrested. And when you come to speak to Grand Pelagie, wherever you were, even as governor of the island, Toussaint had to kneel like everybody else to speak to Grand Pelagie. She had no title. But we had such respect for elders. We had a way of treating each other. All of this is part of the revolution. But I'll conclude this way. The revolution of Haiti, the big difference, Haiti built three tools prior to creating, to going into the revolution. The first tool was create our own cosmic cosmology, our own cosmic view. Because when you study voodoo, it's not about religion. It's about how do you view the cosmos, our own view of the cosmos. What is our relationship to the sun, to the sea, to the plants, to the water? That's what Badu is essentially about. So creating that gave us our own mindset, our own frame of work. The second thing we created is the language, of course. We could say things the way we want to say them. We didn't have to worry about 
How do you say that in English or French or German? We could say it the way we want to say it, the way our soul desires to say it. To say it. And then the third tool was easy. Once you have your own mindset and you have your own language, then you do things your own way. And one example of it is when the French first brought um, the musket, 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 I don't know how to say it. Anyway, it's a gun, a rifle that has a, a, a knife in it. So when they came with that weapon the first time and they were going to go to war with Dessaline. So the way they set up, the French set up is two men for one weapon. So one is on the ground, the other one is standing. And so the one on the ground puts the knife, arm the, the thing, give it to the other one who shoots, and then they rotate and rotate, and that's the way they do it. Dessaline says, if it takes two Frenchmen to do something, then one Aishan can do it. So he trained his men not to do this with two, but to do it with only one person. So when they first line up for the battle, the French started laughing. They said, look at these fools. They have muskets in their hands and they don't know how to use it. But what they did not know, our men were trained. One man, one musket, and trained to kill two. So when you have your own mindset, your own language, then you will develop your own way of doing things. And remember, in fighting, surprise is the biggest weapon. So when you have been trained by your enemy, you cannot surprise him. He has taught you all your moves, your mindset, your philosophy, everything in your head is from him. So when you fight against him, you could hardly win. But when you have your own mindset, then you have your own ways. That's when you can surprise others. And also I will mention that Destiny made it a, um, a practice that if you are coming, if the troops that he's going to face are coming with 10,000, he will make sure he has eight or 7,000. He always fight with fewer men than the other, the, the enemy. So these are lessons we need to learn. Once we know the, our streak, then we can understand, we can identify the significance. And as far as the importance, let me just invite you to go check it out. In the United States, I have come across 11 different towns named Haiti, H-A-Y-T-I. And they have the same essential story. A group of black people rose up and wanted to be free and name their area. They did not fight, they did not have a revolution, but they established their land and they established their way of doing and they named their spot IT. And in almost, I think uh, eight of them, the US government has since uh, renamed, has renamed the, 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 the localities, but the practice still is there. But the, the most famous one is in, in, in North Carolina. Um, hmm, I forget the town that is closest to it. It escapes me for now. But I'm sure if you check H-A-Y-T-I, you will discover. There's also one in the state where Clinton is from. So ask why. Also, uh, Professor Norm mentioned Nat Turner. What I will share about Nat Turner is that in his uh, law, in his trial, at his trial, they asked him at one point, who is your chief? And Nat Turner responded, Jean-Jacques Dessalines. So they say, okay, stop the trial. We'll, we'll, we'll recess and we'll reconvene, blah, blah, blah. And so they did. So they go research that Dessalines tried to arrest him. And so they find out, this is 1831, Dessalines has been dead since 1806. So uh, they come, they reconvene, and the judge with a very, with a smock on his face said, well, who is your chief? And Nat Turner says, Jean-Jacques Dessalines, Emperor of Haiti. And so they responded, but 
he's been dead. Now Turner said, yes, but his spirit guides me. So I will close here and invite you to learn to know Aiti's artistry and identify the significance and the importance of Aiti's artistry, not just to the Caribbean, not just to the Americas, but to the world. Haiti is the country that when Miranda was in trouble in Ecuador, Haiti gave Miranda troops, boats, money, and tell him go back and finish the job of freeing the people. When Bolivar was in trouble, Bolivar came to Haiti, Bolivar found troops, money, men, weapons, and go back to do his work of freeing our people from slavery. When Greece was going famine, IT sent tons of coffee to the Greek government, tell them sell it and feed your people. When the United States uh, uh, was going bankrupt, IT was the first country to give $1 million to the US to help them get back on their feet. Find out what IT has done in your country. Find out whether you're in Europe, in Asia, or anywhere. In fact, Ho Chi Minh said, if one is to one any kind of, of um, warfare, guerrilla warfare, if you don't study IT's revolution, you'll never win. Thank you very much. Be blessed. May our ancestors guide you. Thank you, Professor Bello. Um, well, so we have heard three interesting contributions. One from Professor Horn that gave a historic account of Haiti and its connection with the American Revolution, slavery. We have heard a contribution <clears throat> that deals with Haiti in the present in terms of migration. And then we have heard a, a account from Professor Bello that excavate some very important um, in history concerning the rule of women, children, elders, and sentinels in the Haitian Revolution. And so I'm going to open the floor for <clears throat> participants and so you can address your questions to um, each one of them. So the floor is open for comments and questions. Good evening. Good evening. Good afternoon. My question is to Professor Bellows. Are you hearing me? Yes, ma'am. I am all ears. <laughs> well, your presentation gave me such a, a insight that I never knew before, actually. And um, one, of the, one of my questions that I would like to ask is when we speak about the, the, the Jamaicans, the, 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 where they lit them a fire on the canoes, where did you find that information? Because I've never seen it in any of the books that I've read. Well, who created the school that you go to? Well, we know it's the, the, the colonizers. Right. But I've never so come across. The temp I'm sorry. Go ahead. I've never, I've never seen. A, um, actually, we don't have a lot of books written by Haitian in our own country. Very true. But we have to keep in mind one thing. There is so much. I, I feel, I have only began in the past. I've been doing this searching IT's R Street for the past thirty years, and I feel that I have not begun to scratch the surface. Because every day I come across information that I just never imagined. Um, a simple example, not long ago, about 10 years ago, when I uncovered that St. Croix had a revolution led by three women. Queen Mary was one of them. And these women put the colonizers off the island. For then about a year later, they came back, backed off by other colonizers. They came back, arrested the women, 
take them to jail in, 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 in Holland and uh, et cetera, did whatever. They, they stayed uh, for a number of years. One of them died. One, I think, was returned back to the island after a number of years when she was too old to be able to do anything. And even some years later, these people even had the nerve to coin, to make a coin with her face on it, with the, the three women's faces on it. So, but when I go to St. Croix, no one knows about it. So that's the reality we have to go with. If we want to find out our, our street, do not expect that colonizers and slavers are going to create a historical template that will enable us to find our information. Once you know who you are, you can no longer be a slave. Today, many of us are slaves with PhDs, with masters, with everything. We're slaves. We only know what they want us to know. We have to be bolder than this. We have to say, okay, I got to find it. This is what I know, then what's the truth? Where is the truth? I got to dig, dig deeper. So it's not going to be, I can't tell you, go to this book. I probably can go back to my notes and see where are the few places I read this information because I did read it. It did not fall from the sky. But we have to. And I invite everyone, go to the rare book rooms, to whatever library you go to. Don't go to the room where they expect everybody to come to. If you want to do some serious research, look for the rare book rooms or whatever they call it in your area, find it. But every library has rooms where they keep information that they don't want everybody to have. That's the rule. Thank you yeah. so much. We have a question from Charlene. Is Charlene in? Cindy's, um, is it participant? Uh, Charlene Chase. Sorry, Charlene Chase. We have a question from yeah. Charlene. Yes. Good night, distinguished panel. Good night, everyone else. I have a question for our second speaker who spoke about the Haitian migration or the, the Haitian diaspora. Yes, I'm here. Uh, good night and all the best on your PhD studies. All right, my question is, we're looking at the diaspora, the migration, where we have a lot of Haitians in Mexico and other places and they provide cheap labor. Now, we know that when they liberated themselves, there has been a whole economic downturn, a whole economic oppression. How has this economic oppression contributed to this Haitian migration and what are we doing today about it? Yeah, um, I think the first thing I would to try to answer that question is the economic downturn is because from my perspective, um, Haiti is kind of ostracized from the global market, right? Um, the first black republic, the United States is not with that, right? Um, the, the Spanish Empire with Cuba, they're not going to want to trade with the first black republic because as uh, Ms. Bello has said, like it kind of inspires other people, uh, slaves in Cuba, in Jamaica, in different parts of Louisiana, Florida, St. Croix, to you're trading with the black republic that, that black people can govern themselves. Black people can be free I mean, black people can do the same things that this, these Western empires or these Western cultures are doing. Why can't I just get on a boat and go, go to Haiti right now, right? Especially considering the proximity of Cuba to, to, to Haiti, the Bahamas to Haiti, um, Jamaica to Haiti, right? Um, so I think that um, what really happened is that there was like, um, there wasn't much of a, a trade market for Haiti. So you had some black market trading, right? People who um, um, were looking for cheap um, labor, cheap um, timber or wood, and, and but they, but it wasn't um, fully recognized, right? Whereas in the international market in the early 19th century, France, Spain, Portugal, they're all trading with each other. But Haiti, even though it's an independent country and it's established its own constitution, is not 
able to do that same thing, right? So it remains economically stagnant, but that just depends on your opinions of GDP and gross domestic product, right? And a lot of like Sub-Saharan Latin American countries, a lot of countries in Oceania, like I don't think you should be measuring growth by gross domestic product, right? Um, because people are always working in the informal sector. People are always working outside of the formal sector in Haiti, right? Um, so um, there's a common thing of this idea of um, push-pull factors in migration. Right? Push people out of these developing countries in Sub-Saharan Africa, in Oceania, in the Caribbean, right? It's because, oh, they're poor, they're corrupt, or they're this. No, it's foreign policies by the global north that really make it difficult to establish something in these countries, in Haiti, in these other, um, in, in these other sub-Saharan countries and Oceania and the different parts of the world. Foreign, foreign uh, the, these uh, countries in the global north, like France, Italy, Spain, Portugal, the United States, Canada, Canada's up there too, right? Um, they kind of have a stranglehold on a lot of the southern countries, right? So when Haiti attempts to do these things with the oil trade in Venezuela, right? Or they send, um, like um, um, Professor Bello said, they sent Haitian troops to Bolivia to help liberate um, the Bolivians, right? These are attempts in solidarity and also in um, attempts of creating their own economic um, development without the United States, creating oil trades specifically with the United States or just France or just Canada, not just becoming a tourist destination for the global north, right? So um, I think that that's, that's the best way I can answer your question. I'm sorry. You did a good job. Why sorry? <laughs> Do you want to respond? Hi, could I, could I come in here? Um, this is Musa, Musa Mugabe coming in from Trinidad, uh, formerly from South Trinidad, now live in Central Trinidad. But I'm a tutor, fan tell everyone hi. Um, beautiful presentations from all. Uh, Dr. Bello, Professor Horn, and Pascal, soon to be Dr. Pascal, <laughs> all right? Um, my comment really, and I put up something there in the chat. Um, I usually sit in on these meetings and I, I don't say much really, I just observe and I would um, probably put a few lines in the chat. But ten, tonight I was a bit moved, but it's, it's, it's night for me here. It's long after seven, right? <laughs> we are over in front. Um, it was quite instructive. The, protests that the local population um, organized in Tijuana. Now, to be honest, I didn't know much about it. I don't think much of it was carried in Trinidad, right? I, I stand to be corrected. But um, when you compare that, the fact that over 40,000 Venezuelans Another 58,500, and these are NBC figures, NBC news figures, um, actually moved and migrated to the, to the Caribbean. Since the crisis in, in, in Venezuela um, started many years ago, and there were no such protests, <laughs> right? No such issues coming from the local population. They were actually received with open arms, right? By both the people, and the government's policies were put in place at a high level, at parliamentary level, right? Aid was organized, um, education for the children, the health system was made available to all these, um, these immigrants. It was totally different. We really have a lot of love in the Caribbean, right? And, and sometimes we don't love ourselves because I know um, through the years, Haitians have been moving through the Caribbean islands and coming to the Caribbean islands. And they don't get that kind of um, respect, right? Or aid or assistance. And I just want to throw that out there. I don't want to comment much more about it, but just something you should take note of in your, in your research 
and you know whatever papers or presentations you do from here on you it, it, it will be very instructive okay that's all i have to say and thank you all for the few minutes thank you very much professor horn do you want to respond to you have to raise your hand so maybe i should come in this is uh Ajamu from Trinidad. Um, uh, speak some more please i can hardly hear i cannot hear yeah um, are you hearing me now? Yes, sir. It's a little better. Yeah. Uh, Ajamu from Trinidad. And either um, Professor Bello or uh, Mr. Japanis can take this question, maybe both of you. Um, over the past five, six decades, um, most of the countries in the Caribbean that are run by people of African descent have supposedly been independent. So the question is this, what has the relationship been between Haitian governments and the governments of these countries over those decades? And, and what can be done to improve it? Uh, could someone repeat the question for me, please? I'm not clear. Question was, over the years, the um, Caribbean countries are uh, run mostly by black politicians. And there were some re relations with Haiti. And the, the, the question is, what can we do to help improve the relations with Haiti and the rest of the Caribbean? Oh, okay. is, is everyone hearing me clearly? Maybe I can repeat it myself. We are hearing you, Ajamu. We are hearing you. Okay, again, so um, you, you would think that given that um, there are many countries in the Caribbean that are run by go black governments, okay, why hasn't, you know, more been done to help Haiti over the past 50 or so years? What has the relationship been between Haitian governments and the governments in the Caribbean that have been run by black people over the past 50 or 60 so years? What has that relationship has been like? And if it's not good enough, what can be done to improve it? Now, when I speak, I only speak truth. So if you're not ready to hear truth, please let someone else answer. <laughs> okay, um, I'll, give, I'll give it a shot. <laughs> I'd be happy to hear what Professor Bella has to say. Go, go. Yeah. <laughs> Do you I want to hear her? I want to hear her. Yeah, go for it, Professor Bella. Yes, go ahead. Thank you. Number one, we must be honest with ourselves. A government is a body of people who cares about where uh, the mass, the large mass, what road they're on and how they go from A to point A to point B. Now, we do not have governments. We have people who are in office doing whatever they do and taking orders from outsiders and not caring at all about whether we eat or don't eat. So we must first face up. If that's what the case is, then we have to take a decision about how do we build ourselves so we are who we say we are, our inner self, and then we can stand for whatever. Just imagine Jean-Jacques Dessalines. If you read some of the, 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 the materials, the, the journalistic stuff around 1804, Every country said, well, even if they won the battle, they cannot create a country. They cannot declare independence. They cannot this and they cannot that. Well, Dessalin declared it twice. He made the National Declaration of Independence on November 29, 1803, in a town that he named Fort Liberté, Liberté Fort Liberté, Freedom Fort. And then in Gonaïve, on January 1st, 1804. Look at all that some of you maybe have to do the research on the, the, the diplomatic back and forth among 
the Euro Christians as to what their answer should be to us for declaring independence. Prince prepared an army. So it wasn't, that's an Indian just have it, you know, well, okay, fine, I'm gonna declare independence, la di da, yeah, yeah, happy birthday, it's your birthday. No, the whole world was angry against him, but he did. And that's what governments do for their people. The world could want whatever they want, but you worry about how your people live, what they eat, where they sleep, how they go about their business. That's what governments do. But if everything that is being decided in our countries come from somebody else's, for example, the government of Jean-Claude Duvalier allowing the United States to come and slaughter every pig in the country because, and I'm quoting them, because the sickness, even if we don't see that the pigs are sick, they are, because the white man says so. And the sickness that they have, the wind could blow it to the Texas pigs. That's why they have to come and kill our pigs. If we had a government, that government would say, go find someplace else, leave us alone. But we didn't have a government then. So that's what we have to be. If we say we are intellectuals, we are scholars, and we want to deal with things that matters to our people, then we have to look at these situations. Governments take care of their people at the cost of their lives. That's how it is. I, mean, I want to let um, Professor Horn back into the conversation. Professor Horn? Uh, what is, <clears throat> excuse me, do you have a question for me? No, well, uh, you were silent for a while, so I just wanted to get back into the conversation oh, in terms of how do you link the, the three, the, the other contributions to your contribution? Well, uh, I would like to say that uh, I think just look at the current moment here in the United States where you had an attempted coup on oh. January 6, 2021. It has damaged US imperialism's so-called prestige overseas. That's good. It's going to have enormous impact domestically. Yeah. Speaking of domestically, uh, I, I think that the attempted coup of January 6th in some ways was a final straw for a good deal of the US ruling elite. After all, if you look at what's happened politically and electorally in the United States, you see that there has been a, a kind of a class collaboration, whereas a good deal of Euro-American workers and middle class vote for the Republican Party, and the Republican Party then passes tax cuts for the 1%. The Euro-American working class and middle class have not done as well. Then they punctuate that by putting in Donald J. Trump, who lets the coronavirus rage out of control, which is killing tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands. And then to punctuate it all, he tries to pull off a coup on January 6th. And so I think that what's happening is that the US ruling class feels that they need a new electoral and political coalition. They feel they can rely more on black voters because if black voters try to pull off a coup, you can liquidate them without hardly any difficulty. And besides that, the defect of the black American community, which is what we in the United States have to resolve, is that many black Americans have learned the lesson that if you get too involved in foreign affairs, bad things happen. Martin Luther King condemns the war in Vietnam in 67, he's murdered in 68. Paul Robeson is attacked in 1950 after he brings the United States to the United Nations on charges of committing genocide against black people. However, if it is in fact true that there is going to be a shift uh, to the Democrats and with the Democrats being heavily dependent upon black voters, it's up to us to get the black voters to get more re-engaged on foreign affairs, which brings us to having the, our Caribbean friends invite a black American delegation 
to CARICOM meetings, for example, or to have our Caribbean friends invite Black American delegations to meet with their peers and counterparts in Jamaica, in Trinidad, et cetera. That would be in your interest and that would be in our interest. Um, I just- I'm the pharmacy, I'm just to answer my question. Um, so I, I'd be happy to hear from you. Um, me, you want me to answer the question? Yeah, you, you. Okay, um, so I just want to say, um, I think, so there's a lot of, um, I think there's a lot of stigma around Haitians and migration in the Western hemisphere, right? So there's a lot of black governments, black politicians in government, just like uh, um, Professor Bello says, and just like um, Professor Horn is talking about with um, autonomy or a sovereignty, right? She talks about Diwali and she's spot on. Like um, it's, it's kind of like puppet states in a lot of way for the, 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 um, these colonial powers, right? Something else that I want to add to that is, you know, we're a Francophone country. And I think that most Haitians, when you talk to us, we can immediately recognize other Francophone nations in the Caribbean, like Martinique, Guadeloupe, St. Lucia, Dominican, right? There are smaller islands that maybe other um, Anglophone and um, Hispanophone countries don't really know about, but we know about them because they're pretty similar to us, right? Even parts of Louisiana, right, in the United States, they're pretty similar to us, right? Um, so um, I think that, like, if you if you think of it in that way, it's like, one, it's a language barrier, right? Another thing to really think about is recently in South Africa, right? So I'm going to talk about not the Caribbean, but other Black people in other parts of the world. In South Africa, there's been this, um, a lot of xenophobic riots against Nigerian migrants, right? Um, in 2019, 600 Nigerian migrants were expatriated from South Africa, right? Mm -hmm. And when you read about these things, you're like, well, why are South Africans why are, South, why are Nigerians leaving South Africa? And you read and you realize that the South Africans are attacking Nigerians. And when you hear the rhetoric that South Africans are saying, they're saying that the South Africans, they're saying that Nigerians, Botswanans, other people from different parts of Africa are coming into Africa and stealing their jobs, right? But Nigerians are taking a particular brunt of this because they're seen, they're, they're, they're stigmatized. They're, there's a specific stigmatization with them, right? So the reason I'm using that example is just so you understand, right? So there's, some, there's sometimes a stigma, there's a stigma attached to Haitians, one, right? But this stigma is not something that is because we are who we are, but something that is learned, right? Mm -hmm. Something that can really be maybe attributed to the idea of capitalism, right? The South Africans, the black South Africans are fearful that other Nigerians are coming in, other black people are coming in and stealing their jobs. Qu'est-ce que ça? Huh? They're coming in and stealing your jobs? This is the same rhetoric that the United States uses when they talk about Mexicans or mm -hmm. Central Americans coming in and stealing their jobs, right? It's another idea of maybe if these people come in, the, these Haitians, these Nigerians, these Mexicans, the city is gonna crumble, right? It's gonna deteriorate. Well, that's not true. It's just not true, right? So I think that the reason why there's so much um, like um, discontinuity or like not connection with Caribbean culture, one is like barrier and two, stigma, you know? And we have to work through these. If I uh, let me just behave here. Okay. Hold yeah, on one second. I just to um, yeah, hold on one second. Let, let me um answer Brother Jamu's question. Yeah, um, there is a perception in the Caribbean that because we have black governments, that is supposed to mean something. Mm -hmm. Having a black person in power means absolutely nothing. This has this has been the story we have fed ourselves. Um, I was in a session a couple of weeks ago. I don't want to take up too much time. In which it seems in academia in the Caribbean that somehow they are promoting Eric Williams as this radical hero, right? 
without examining Williams' policies. You know, people like to refer to the statement Williams make about Massa Day done as some kind of you know, progressive statement. But that was just a statement. It was nothing more than a statement because at the same time that he made that statement, there was no policy to decolonize education or to decolonize anything. So we move from a colony of Britain to a, to a neo colony, a, a neo colonial state, with all the, the the commanding heights of the economy, the political systems, all of these things rooted in the British tradition. Okay, this is why recently in Trinidad, you had a situation where to move a Columbus statue, people didn't want to move it, right? So saying that uh, um, why black governments don't support. Haiti. These are colonized people. We are we are colonized. We we we, we make we have something in we call simidimi. These anthems and these flags are simidimi, just what I call elaborate rituals. So these governments are extremely back. We are the state of the Caribbean now, where the Jamaican government is supporting the US against Venezuela. Okay. Right? Where um, uh, other Caribbean countries are, are locked st stuck um, lined up. With the U.S., we are, these are not progressive people. The Black Power movement in Trinidad, which I was part of, forced the Trinidad government to take certain radical actions. And what did they do? Locked us up, put us in jail, um, claimed that if we won the election, they would make, we make everybody change their names to Bubu Jubu in a derogatory manner, right? So this is the tradition. So contrary to what people are believing, that because we have black governments and black leaders that we are, they are automatically supposed to be progressive. That is a misnomer, right? So it is no wonder that they will not develop any kind of relationship with it. It's the same way they have an ambivalent relationship with Cuba, right? You know, we, we, we have a term, we, again, we use a term called gambage, in which you pretend you want to fight or you pretend you are one way, and that's what they do, they are pretensive. So it's no long wonder that they will never develop proper relations with Haiti or with Cuba. They are just plain colonized and until we, the progressives decide to do something about it, that is always going to remain. I remember I was traveling from Cuba to Trinidad in the 1980s. There was a crisis in Haiti and the PNM campaign on the fact that if you let Haitians come in, what a catastrophe it will be for Trinidad. And a lot of Afro Trinidadians believe that the PNM is a progressive government when it's the most anti-Black government in the history of Trinidad and Tobago. And these are the, the misnomers and the, 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 the falsehoods that we embrace, right? And, and then believe that based on these facts, that these people, or the, not facts, but or based on these perceptions, that these people are progressive, they are not. And until we decide we want progressive governments, that is always going to be. That is my short contribution. I, I hope I didn't say it too long. I just wanted to make a contribution. Go ahead. In, to, I'm sorry. Go ahead, to yeah, go ahead. Okay. I think one of the things that a lot of us in the Caribbean have to come to terms with is who we are, what we accept, and what we are okay with. We are proud in Trinidad specific, because I'm talking about being born there and living there for the last 13 years. We are proud. Catholics, as if Catholic is a race of people. <laughs> when you say you are African, they tell you they're Catholic and it, it, it started to confuse me. One <laughs> of the things where the, the, the Venezuelans will be accepted and the Haitians would not be accepted in Trinidad is black Trinidadians are of the belief that voodoo is something crazy and it's going to upturn their Catholicness. And we have to come to terms with that. We have families who feel that way. A student of mine, she's on this um, meeting right now. I'm telling her about the whole Columbus thing. And, she's, and she couldn't understand why it was important to have the Columbus statue removed. This is a 15 year old. And her thought was, we are removing our history. And I went on to tell, if you really want to know your history, do a little more research. 
And a few weeks later, she came back and she said to me, she said, you know, this Columbus thing got to go because it really doesn't make sense. But this is a 15 year old who was sent on a path to get some information. And she went and she flies in the face of everybody she socializes with because she knows just a tiny bit more. So we ourselves have to accept how we feel about Haitians and why it will be okay. The nonsense you hear about why the Venezuelans are there because the Indian men like them and the African men like them and it's going to make so few children. And all this nonsense is part of who we are as Trinidadians and we have to accept that. What we have to do is decolonize ourselves and understand when the imperialist takes a hold of your soul. And that is a personal thing people have to look in the mirror and come to terms with. So while we want everybody to do this stuff, we cannot deal with ourselves and our own relatives as to what and why Venezuelans will be accepted and Haitians would not. And it starts in the root of what we have accepted and believe and continue to accept today. That's my contribution. Um, there are some people that hands up, Dr. Grinson. Yes. Yeah. Dr. Brother Green. A quick comment to suggest to, um, to, 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 to Brother hold on, Brother Jamu, hold on, please. There are some other people with their hands up a long time. Brother Green is one. Yeah. Uh, okay. Can, can Brother you? Green, go, go ahead. Okay. Um, Brother Arco and uh, all those who have organized this wonderful program, I would like to salute you and uh, congratulate you on this very erudite, um, intellectual, and also this wonderful communal gathering. Uh, so thank you very much to all the organizers. Um, from, I would just like to put out uh, something for consideration uh, to all the speaker, uh, Professor Gerald Hond, uh, Professor Bella, and to be Professor uh, Pascal will be coming up soon. This uh, should be the initiation of trying to organize an inst international institute uh, for the study of the Haitian Revolution and for the significance of Haiti in world history and uh, related to the issue also. Uh, just from some of the comments, especially the last sister uh, who spoke, there is an imperative for us to see how we can organize uh, internationally to put Haiti at the very forefront of um, international study, uh, not only for people of African descent, but for all people because of its significance in uh, certain changes that have taken place over the world from the revolutionary uh, development in Haiti to this very moment. So congratulations again. And I'm looking forward for us to really think of organizing uh, an international institute for the study of Haiti and the significance of the Haitian revolution. A lot of books have been written in recent years about Haiti. And we, we, we really need to, uh, you know, garner the forces that we have. It might sound that we don't have much, but if we are, are serious, if we are committed, we can move forward. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Brother Ambo Kile Adio has been up for a long time. Ambo Kile Adio. Uh, thank you. Pleasant good evening to everyone. Um, Congratulations on this very rich, very, very, very rich um, information that I've been sharing here today. Uh, quickly, um, well, I haven't, I haven't been there from the beginnings. I've missed a lot of the contribution of Sister Bell, uh, Professor Bello. I, I was very impressed with what you have to say. And um, I don't know if this was dealt with, but I want to ask the question, what about, about the contemporary in that it's my belief that the seeds from Dessalines and to say it is still there. 
It is still there. And I want to point to the, I want to bring back the whole incident with Aristide. And I remember President Aristide was galvanizing this country, started talking about education and, and stuff like that. And suddenly, uh, army was, a girl army was raised up next door in Dominican Republic to overthrow him. The, the, the United States came in an airplane and escorted him to South Africa. And then when the army that overthrew him wanted to come into power, they said, no, these are ragtag. They call them ragtag army. Okay, so you know, I want to ask, could, it seems to me that given if the people are allowed to, to pursue their own means of development, they can still reach those, those, those glorious heights that they once attained where they were able to lend money to the, to the US and to, to, to give to, to um, send the coffee beans to, to, to Greece and so on. It is in the people. I don't believe these things ever leave the people. So I want us, you know, in, look, we look at the history, but I'm saying even in this contemporary Haiti, Haitians there, they probably they might be kept back because the education might not be white, just like China was. Okay, China has blossomed. But it was always within the people to be that way, right? You, you give, you educate the masses, and you provide the, the right resources, and the people will come forward. What the, what are, what is in the people will come forward. So I want to know: Are we? How do we look at that? The contemporary situation. It, I, I'm saying, I'm asking the question based on my belief that what has been planted in the past, it's still there. Although they, they, they might look bad, you know, all the people, they have to flee with poverty and they love to highlight these things. So that, that's my question. Any, you know, one of the presentations. Before, before anyone answers, uh, um, Brother Ako, how, many, how much time do we have? We don't have much time. And I would like people to ask a question, please. We all know we are all smart. So ask a question. And when you ask your question, please let somebody else, Brother Paul Courthan has been up for a while and Rick. So we don't have much time, maybe 15, 20 minutes again. So All right, please so what, shorten your questions. So what we'll do, we, we, I will allow each um, professor to answer your question. So we'll, I'll take um, Professor Horn first, then Professor Bello, and then my brother. Yeah. Well, you know, I've, I've spoken quite so a to, bit. To respond to the brothers, um, it's the contemporary issue of Haiti. Right. With mean? regard to that, uh, one of the points I would like to stress is Cuban solidarity, because the Haitian Revolution and the Cuban Revolution are akin to two peas in a pod. We all know that the Cuban government supplies medics to Haiti, supplies other personnel to Haiti. And it seems to me that if we're concerned about contemporary Haiti, we should also be concerned about the improper illegal US blockade of Cuba, which if lifted would allow Cuba to supply more aid, development aid to Haiti. And so once again, I would like to stress that we should not only be in solidarity with the Haitian revolution, uh, we should be also in solidarity with the Cuban revolution. Thank you very much. Prof Professor Bello. All right, I say, the major, the, the, the essential problem with all of us, Haitians, Cubans, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, taking nothing away from what Professor Horn just said, which is fine, but me, I say, essentially, we who have gone through slavery, colonizations, we are not ourselves. And we need to do the first work as the sister said a little while earlier, knowledge of self, build yourself. Once we know if I am who I am as an Asian woman, I could never not support Cubans. How could I? There is no way. If I am myself, there is no way if something serious is being done in Jamaica that I'm not part of it. I will do everything to have my little piece in there. I've lived in Africa. Jamaica is a, an island that I love. I've, for years, that was my IET. Uh, Cuba is an expression of the 
uh, Aishan revolution in a different time. So I have great admiration for Cuba. Um, Hugo Chavez was a man who had an inner self well-developed and he understood and wanted to do all kinds of things to, to create uh, this bonding among ourselves, which is important. But mm, he did say that he, he realized, he observed that a number of uh, head of states, South American head of states who had been at a particular meeting in DC, then they find themselves all with the same cancer problem. So if we want to understand, we'll understand. But if we're not courageous enough to even accept what has happened, how can we take courageous steps in the present? We must Pascal, assume sorry. what has happened. We must assume it. We must know IT has no friends. I don't care what people say. And when people are saying, oh, the international and then the Haitian, wait a minute, international is without IT in it? Without Jamaica in it, international are some other folks? They look different, the international people? What is this? So we have to be more for real. And wherever we see untruth, whenever we see injustice, then if we are ourselves, our true divine self, then we will fight for truth. We will fight for justice wherever. Me, yes, I'm Asian, but I have fought in, it doesn't matter to me. If I'm in the US and there's something going on and it's justice, wherever justice, I feel justice is, and that's where I will be, okay? But if we are afraid, we're afraid to lose the visa, you're afraid to lose the job, you're afraid to lose, <laughs> Well, then, listen, take the world the way it is and shut up. Brother Paul Court, Paul Court, question, please. Yes, thank you very, very much for the opportunity to speak. And good evening, everyone. Thank you to all the presenters. Your knowledge has been really eye-opening. Uh, special thank you to Dr. Bello, uh, who is... Uh, words have been very striking. Uh, the, th the question I'd like to ask is, uh, concerning what was uh, mentioned by the uh, moderator at the very beginning, and it's a question that I've always been asking, um, why is it and why haven't strong steps been taken to correct this error, that whenever history in the Caribbean is taught to the black child, and I have three children of my own and I'm making very, very valiant efforts to make sure that this doesn't happen. Why is it that we continue to teach African history on the Caribbean curriculum as if African history started with slavery or, or enslavement rather, that uh, you know, where in all our textbooks it starts when uh, the Europeans brought Africans to the Caribbean as if before then we were absolutely nothing and we came here to be something. And uh, I want to know why more intellectuals have not been pressuring CXE, have been pressuring Caribbean governments to correct this nonsense. I'm an educator of 25 years and I'm sick and tired of it. Dr. Vincent, that might be one for you. <laughs> well, I was educated well, in Trinidad. As I said in the 1980s, <laughs> it, as I said in the 1980s, um, one morning at, in UE, we challenged Dr. Gifts, and he vehemently said, "No, it is not going to change. We are going to drop the Haitian Revolution." Um, again, it's based on in, in, in terms of the Eurocentric teachings of history. Um, many years ago. Uh, this famous um, British historian said that Africa has no history and Africa will never have a history. His, um, darkness is not history and we don't teach darkness. But we know that is a myth. Trevor Roper, that was said by Trevor Roper. And we know that Trevor Roper trained many Brit um, Caribbean, African and other scholars. And they went back to, the, to these nations 
and taught that nonsense. Here we have in the Caribbean, Eric Williams, our famous historian politician, who wrote many books from Columbus to Castro, books on slavery, etc. But Eric Williams never corrected that Eurocentric perception of Haiti, never corrected that Eurocentric perception of Africa. So at the, at the University of the West Indies, in Trinidad, Mona, and, and Cayville, they have never corrected that perception. And so it is up to a new generation of scholars to challenge that, that those notions of history. And until we do that, then we will be just repeating the same thing over and over again. So that many people don't know up to today why Haiti was dropped from the CXC curriculum and was never corrected. People don't know that because Dr. Giff and them decided to bury it. And those of us who, who protested were silent. But we are refusing to be silent. I have refused to be silent. And it's something, when I taught at the CXC level, I ensured that I hit the Haitian Revolution was foremost in my teaching because it informed me and my students that Wilberforce did not emancipate slaves. The Haitian Revolution was very transform transformative in terms of liberation. And we have to continue that scholarship. Rick, I know you've been asking um, James Millet, James Millet, James Millet has a, his hands up. Yeah, well, yes, I saw Dr. Millet here, but this brother has been here for a long, long time. So we'll have him, then All Dr. Right. Millet, and then Dr. Professor Bello. So Rick, yes. you'll ask your question, and we have very limited time. Please, Rick. Yeah, hi. Um, thank you so much for taking me. Um, I just wanted to ask, uh, I, I'm in New York City, and um, I challenge, there's this thing called curriculum, like um, your vision is this company. And I just challenged them the other day because when um, they cover a lot of curriculum of New York State and what they put for the Haiti portion has a lot of foreign sources. So kind of like my question had to do with, tie with what the brother was asking, like how can the curriculum in Haiti and the Caribbean, like, you know, in high school and middle school, like how can, um, that kind of help in driving that scholarly interest in Haitian history um, or in um, a, a history that helped to decolonize Alma. Okay. Anybody want to answer that question? Dr. Bello, would you like to answer that question? Pascal? Yeah, um, really quickly, I think that if you incorporate like um, these early African kingdoms, histories of um, these African empires, um, um, traditional societies in different parts of the world, if you incorporate that earlier on, it really motivates students to um, pursue these degrees when they go into um, college and university, right? When I was in high school, I took a world history class. We learned nothing about Sub-Saharan Africa we didn't learn anything about Caribbean history, right? We learned about Europe and we learned about China or parts of China, right? That's it. That's the world. So, um, you know, I think that it's, it's if you encourage um, people to learn about the Jolof Empire, the Khan State, the Cong Congo Kingdom, the, um, you know, um, these different these different parts of the African Kingdom, uh, uh, Sub-Saharan Africa, right? Not just North Africa, but Sub-Saharan Africa. You build that foundation. When they go to university, they're going to d pursue degrees in Black studies, in Africana studies, in international studies, in African American history, right? Caribbean history, and then this is how these departments stay alive. So. Yeah, you you have these classes, and they teach about the these specific kingdoms, just like they teach about um, European and East Asian um, civilizations, you're gonna find people. The new generation will come and they'll, they'll latch onto it. 
Professor Miller. Uh, can you hear me? Are you hearing me properly? Yes. Yes. Okay. Well, first of all, congratulations. I, I came here not knowing what to expect. And I've received a lot more than I imagined. Um, there are two things I want to say. First of all, I want to associate myself with a lot that the main presenters have said. And to indicate that many of these questions have been around for a long time. <laughs> the, the answers are still to come. And until those answers come, and until we start implementing the answers that we believe to be right, we will keep asking the questions over and over, generation after generation. At some stage, we have to stop that. And we have to start understanding, for example, that the, the Haitian revolution was a revolution of oppressed people. And the reason why Haiti has been what it has been is because the people who triumphed in that revolution were black and poor. In other words, there's a racial element, there's a class element, and in addition to that, there's an environmental question. The question has to reckon with the fact that Haiti became independent by revolution in a world that was generally speaking imperialist. And it took over a hundred years before other parts of the Caribbean, which today we call CARICOM, were to become independent. Um, my, uh, my parting word, so to speak, is continue the work <laughs> because the work has been going on for over 100 years. We can put a, a couple more years onto it. But we have to continue the work, and I think that the the the, um, and the 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 size of the task is suggested by the fact that up to today it seems that people are still talking about African history as if it started in 1492. There may be a case for saying that New World history started in 1492. I'm not saying that there is, but there may be a case for saying that there is, but there could be no case for saying that, there, that African history started in 1492. In fact, uh, African history started hundreds of thousands of years ago. And the question that we have to ask ourselves is why is it that we who gave birth to the rest of the human race are where we are today? That's my question. I don't know whether we have time to answer it, but that's the question. Dr. Bello, do you want to respond to Dr. Millet? <coughs> you, unmute yourself, unmute. Unmute. You're unmute. unmute. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. All right. Um, I will respond in this way. We need I to- make a contribution. We need to be systematic. Mm -hmm. Our R Street, did not begin in 1492, that's clear. Now, every country in IT, that's the thing I've been saying for the past 30 years, the missing chapters of IT's history. The first chapter has to be the chapter of those who were here prior to the invasion of Euro Christians in 1492. This island was named IT for more than 4,000 years prior to this. So the our street of this island does not begin in 1492. So we need to collect the data 
and put a regular chapter on the Arawak, the Tupi, the Siboney, the Vien Vien, the 12 ethnic groups who were here when these invaders arrived. The second missing chapter of Haiti's history, but it would be the same for Jamaica, for Trinidad, would be the same. The second missing chapter is, we say, yeah, we're from Africa. And what do you know about Africa? Mm. Uh, do you know about the Igbos, uh, the Ghana Empire, the Shanghai Empire? Mm. Well, if you come from Africa, then it's a must. Then it ha you have to give context to Africa. So there is a chapter. You're not going to take every single country, but you're going to take the major, the, the greater empires, and then a generalized of five segments of um, five sectors. So uh, Aishan Chal at 10, when he says Africa, he has content. A Jamaican child has content, mm -hmm. uh, et cetera. So then we have to seriously talk about those who arrived in 1492. What were they doing in the 10th century? In the 11th century, those centuries that they don't talk about. When they were painting their bodies and eating each other, we have to talk about it. We have to make it clear who they are. And we have to understand that all the crimes committed against us, they had a practice of doing it to each other years before they knew we existed. So it was nothing new. They, were, they had thousands of years of practicing slavery, slaughtering, impaling, crucifying, castrating. That was a regular business. So we have to understand what kind of people they are. If we want our children to be ready to fight and take their place in this world, we have to know. If you're going to fight cats, you need to know about cats. But if you're going to fight tigers, you need to study tigers very well and have a very good plan if you hope to win facing tigers. So let's not both our cats, but they're not the same cats. So let's study. If we're serious about going and taking our place, taking your place, your place is occupied by someone else. So then you need massive knowledge of those who are in your place so you can make a proper plan. And then you must teach your children because it will be a generational, it won't be a you know three months or seven or 10 year battle. And that's why we cannot look at the Asian revolution as a 14 year thing, because then we misunderstand. The battle begun in 1492 and many fell on the way, many women, men, children, and elders. So we have to make it clear. When you see the revolution that way, then you can understand, all right, if I'm gonna start fighting now, hey, I have to prepare my great-grandchildren. And that's the way to, that's, that's the key. If we look at it, not from ourselves, but look, we're fighting for the next 21 generations. If we can't look the battle that way, no need to start it. Take your rocking chair and stand in front of the TV or sit in front of the TV. I want to um, bring this meeting to an end, unfortunately, because of time. And I want to thank Professor Horn, Professor Bello, PhD scholar Pascal, and all participants who came into this ses important session. We have, uh, as a historian, I've learned something new to tonight. Mm -hmm. and I hope that all of us have learned something new and that we will take this discourse and continue the discourse even after to today and even organize in your communities things about Haiti, the Caribbean, Africa, and the African diaspora. And let's, let's continue this dialogue and not just leave it there. today, but this is a continuing dialogue. So I want to thank all of you all and that we know that we have all learned something new today. And that's the takeaway for me. So before, but, but uh, Godfrey, before we close off, um, um, let me, there's a 
gentleman, a brother who's been asking a lot of questions, I've been asking a question for a long time and I and he deserves a chance to get his question before we formally close. Okay. He's been around for a long time. Lloyd, I think it is from uh, Lloyd from Jamaica. Well, Lloyd, yeah, Hello. it's Lloyd Webb there, Dr. Webb, Lloyd, Not Lloyd Webb, Andrew. Lloyd Green, Dr. Lloyd Green, I think it is. I've seen a okay. Lloyd. Hello, hello, I, hello. Yes, yes, sir. Yeah, we, yeah, we hear you, yes. Right, it, it's not really a question, just um, a comment. Dr. Bella was, um, I'd mentioned something about um, Desaline fighting with fewer men than the opposition. And I've read several books about the Haitian Revolution and realized that most of the battles that, which were fought, that was the situation. The Haitians as fewer fighters, yet they defeated the oppressors. And I thought that was so fantastic. There was one particular one that I, I read about. There were about 1,200 persons and the, um, the French had something like 12,000, and those 1,200 Asians defeated them. I just wanted to make that comment. And I think we need to talk more about things like that. The Battle of Creta Piro. Ah, that's it. I could not remember it. Thank you so much. Right. And actually, the British said that the French cheated in saying there were 12,000. There were 18,000 French. Yeah against a thousand Haitian. Right. And the yeah. US say that the British didn't have the right numbers because there were 24,000 French against the 1,000 Haitian. Okay, so. okay. Thank you so much. Thank you, thank you. Wonderful thank evening. You. Um, just you. a quick thing, if I may. Um, Dr. Bello, um, how can I get my hands uh -huh. on some of your books? <laughs> Uh, well, we, we haven't had much in English. Uh, if you can read Aishan, if you can read French. <laughs> but we do have one book, Sheroes of the Aishan Revolution. That's in English, and that's available on Amazon. Okay, so let us, um, no more questions, please. We have, to point out that we have to go. I would say this. One of the things we are planning at the Seven Continent Center is to publish and we are in the process of publishing two books. So we would want to speak to Dr. Bello about possibly getting her books published. So that is something you can keep in touch with us about. Thank you. Um, because one of the things we realize we have to do is establish our own publishing institutions. And so we, right now we have three books that we are about to publish hopefully um, at the end, uh, before the end of this year uh, into next year. One is on CLR James, one is on the life of George Weeks, prominent trade union leader in Trinidad, and another one is a children's book. So to answer that brother's question. Um, so my responsibility was to open and to close, so I'm closing. Um, I want to thank um, Professor Horn. I, Professor Horn is, is one of my favorite persons. You may not have known this, but I've loved this work for, for a very long time. And for years, I've been trying to get him to come to Trinidad, but he's not a very easy person to get in touch with, but finally we were able to get in touch with him. So I still hope that when this COVID thing is over, we can have him come down to the Caribbean and share his wide knowledge with us. I want to thank um, Professor Baina Bello from IET for her wonderful contribution and insight. Um, thank you very much. Our young um, person, Pascal Dafanis, and I want to thank him. I, I've always said in, in both the organizations here and the one I'm operating in Trinidad, that we talk about involving young people, but we don't involve them. It is always a talk, but never, never direct action. We talk down to them, but not with them. And I was happy that Pascal is here, and I hope that we will um, do this more in the future. In fact, my take from the from the from the um, inauguration was this: when I saw the young woman who said the poem, and I saw Kamala Harris, I said, 
as a progressive thinking person, we have to pay a lot of attention to our young people and to our women, because I believe that is the next trust to undermine our struggle by using youth and women in a particular way. So I'm happy that Pascal is, is here representing youth. So again, I, Dr. Millet is a long-standing radical Trinidadian. <laughs> I haven't seen him in 40 years. I'm happy to see him online. And um, I'm glad that he's still with us and, and still a progressive thinker. Again, to all the participants, the, the people who were involved in this, I want to thank you very much for taking the time out. To Sister Cindy from St. Martin, one of my favorite places in the Caribbean. <laughs> Happy that you uh, volunteered to be the administrator and to the members of the uh, Seven Continent Center, uh, Sister Kabu, Brother Imo, Sister Cindy, Sister Fanta and others. We appreciate the effort that was put into making this a success. But I'm Thank you all very you much. Bef before, you yes. go, before you close, I, I just want to um, tell the audience that in Next month, we are having a very important discussion or discourse about Claudia Jones. Yes. So yes. We, we would like you all to stay tuned and we will be putting all that information very soon. Um, we'll have C Professor Carl Boyce Davies, Rosemary Milley, and another scholar on that panel. Yes, and absolutely. absolutely. And then also in March, we'll be doing a panel on neoliberalism, the neoliberal agenda and its impact on women. So that will be the next two events. So thank you for reminding me, um, brother. And we look forward to your participation again. Thank you all very much. I know some people tried to get in and they couldn't, but um, you have to be early. <laughs> so once again, thanks to everyone and thanks to our specially invited guests, um, Professor Horn, Professor Bello and Pascal de Fenis. Thank you all and be safe in these times of COVID. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you all. Have a good night. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Great discussion. Yeah. Thanks. Thank Thanks. you, Professor Horn. You, you, have to tell, you have to tell Professor right on. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. All right.